Welcome to Inside the Set with Set Decor. Inside the Set is a series that focuses on the design and decor of stories that excite us and ignite our imaginations, where we get to discuss the collaborations between production designers and set decorators and hear firsthand accounts of how those works of art came to be, from their inception to ideas on the page through completion, where we sit in the dark and experience them collectively. Hi, and welcome to Inside the Set with Set Decor. I'm Regina Graves, SDSA. Today, I have the pleasure of speaking with Adam Willis, set decorator, and Jack Fisk, production designer of Killers of the Flower Moon. Thank you for being with us. We're going to start out with asking how you got into this business. A lot of our viewers love that. And Jack, how did you get into this business? And how did you come to working with Marty on Killers? Wow, uh, this covers 50 years. <laughs> I was <laughs> well, you could speed through. Okay. It. I came out to LA in 1970 uh, and uh, was looking for work. I, I had hoped to paint billboards, but at the time the studios were in uh, turmoil and all the scenic artists were painting billboards, so there were no jobs available. And uh, I was offered a job for $100 a week working on a non union film. And that was in 1970, and I'm still doing it. It took me uh, three films to get up to art director. And once I found that position, I was I was happy. I thought I would try it for a year, and then I did that. And then I said, well, maybe I'll try it for five years. I tried it for five years, and I loved it. And in that five years, I actually, the second year I was working, I met Terrence Malick. And Terry and I did uh, several films together, quite a few films together. And it was exciting because when I met Terry, I realized that filmmaking – was an art form just like painting or sculpture and an important art form and you could say a lot more than just the writing on the page and i met an actress on badlands his first film and i became really in tune to actors and wanted to do sets that would help them so all my stuff is very character driven and conscious to give a space for the actors to feel comfortable in when I worked with David Lynch on Mulholland Drive, he was an old uh, friend. We went to high school together in Virginia. He's still my best friend. And I worked with Paul Thomas Anderson on two films, which I loved. He's just a great person, exciting to be around. And then Alejandro and Yurutu. And in the beginning, I worked with Brian De Palma on a couple of films, including Carrie and uh, Phantom of the Paradise. And... I got in that mix, I got to work with Stanley Donnan on a picture, which was just great because he's such a classic director from Singing in the Rain and, and Seven Brides for Seven Brothers and many other things. So it's just been an exciting ride for me. I, I love it. And uh, Marty was like, I don't want to say the pinnacle because I wanted to keep going, but he it was so great working with Marty. I, I was shocked at how young he is at his age and how open he was to suggestions and how excited he is about filmmaking. You know, when you're around people like that, it's infectious and you just want to do more, you want to do it better. And uh, it was a real pleasure working with Marty. Was it a big surprise getting the call from Marty for this job? It was, it was because I knew about the project for a couple of years, but I knew that he had a designer that he worked with regularly. So I had kind of thought I would love to do that film, but it, you know, it will never be available. And then when I got the call, I was I was kind of floored, but very excited. Great. And Adam, what about you? How did you get your start? Um, it was really kind of super random. I, I was in film school at, uh, in North Carolina at UNC Wilmington, and I was living in this this big kind of old mansion from like early 1900s um, with like six other guys. And uh, I had a location person come to our house. They wanted to shoot a scene from a movie in our house. And I was like, immediately just like, this is so crazy. I can't believe this. They offered us $500, but part of the deal was if you let us work on the film in some capacity, like that's a deal. And I got put in on this film. It was called Loggerheads. I was the art PA on it. I ended up very quickly getting a lot of responsibility on that job because it was a small crew to the point where the designer was basically just having me go off and like decorate most of the sets. And I didn't even really know what, you know, what was the job or anything, but I really liked it. And I ended up working with that same crew on two other uh, indie features back to back right after that. But on that film, I met uh, Chad Keith, who's a production designer now that I have, I've worked with for a lot. I've probably done like 
at least 10 films with Chad. Chad really started to move up a bit, and he uh, he got a job on a film called Goodbye Solo with uh, director Ramin Barani, um, who's an, an incredible director. And that film ended up going to Venice and won the Fopretsky Award there. And after that, Chad got an agent. And then really quickly, he was kind of like, you know, getting more interesting films. And we were kind of just traveling all around like the South, you know, just kind of me and Chad, you know, doing movies. And, and at that time, like, I didn't even know, I think I was working on them as like an art director. Like, I didn't even know what an art director was. I didn't know what a set decorator was. I was just basically kind of doing everything. And I would also be on set at the same time. And then not long after I was working with Chad, I ended up working with Jade Healy, who's another great production designer I've been fortunate to work with a lot. And that was on a film called Ain't Them Body Saints um, by director David Lowry. And it was his first feature that he did. It was like a really kind of interesting film for me because it was kind of like a timeless period film. So it was early in my career kind of dealing with like these kind of classic, you know, like 60s kind of 70s spaces that, you know, again, this is early in my career. I had no idea really what this was. And I was just learning about it every day. I went on uh, to work with Jade on many films, like I did Marriage Story with her, with Noah Baumbach and uh, Killing of a Sacred Deer with uh, Yorgos Lanthimos. And actually through Jade, I also met Elliot Hostetter, who's another designer I work with and started doing like Harmony Corinne's films whenever he did like Spring Breakers. And I've worked with Elliot on many films. And But back to Chad, I did a film called Loving with Chad with director Jeff Nichols. It's interesting because I was working on this TV show, Euphoria, and I got a call from Richmond, Virginia while I was at work. And I was like, who's calling me from Richmond, Virginia? And it was Jack. And he's like, hi, this is Jack Fisk. And I was like, is somebody pranking me? Like, why is Jack Fisk calling me? <laughs> and, you know, Jack told me that he had watched uh, a film I did called Loving at the Richmond Film Festival. And he he said he really loved it and kind of felt like it was done a similar way that he would do it. And that's kind of my first introduction with Jack. And I ended up going to do this film Causeway with him that Apple made. And he just really enjoyed the experience and taught me so much. Not long after that, it was... You know, I got that email in the summer of COVID and he's like, do you want to do this Martin Scorsese movie? And I was like, this is, I was just blown away because I'm a huge film nerd anyway. And, you know, Marty's films have always been really important to me. And, and at that moment, it was just like go time. And I couldn't stay off the computer looking at research and just, you know, finding every single thing I could about that time period and was just obsessed for like a year and a half until we were finished. Once you learn about a film, they've got you. You, you yes. work 24-7. Yeah. But uh, Adam and I, uh, we work, work very similarly. And uh, we had a lot of fun on Causeway because we uh, decided we'd just find the locations ourselves. The location manager, he was only showing us things that he had already shot in. And we figured there must be more to New Orleans than those locations. So we rode around in the car and... and uh, it's amazing how we get, we tuned into the same locations and they later became our sets. Mm -hmm. it, was, it was a fun collaboration. That's always great when you find uh, someone you can work with really well. It's like, you know each other, you're attuned to each other. It just, it just helps so much, um, especially as a decorator and bouncing off ideas with each other. You feel more confident, don't you? Like in your choices and just everything that you do. It's great. Oh, yeah. yeah, it really helps. So let's get back to talking about uh, Killers of the Flower Moon. So every project starts with research. Like you were just saying, you were hooked, Adam, um, when you first got the job. Since this is more like a documentary and it's based on, you know, true facts, how did you, how did you go about it all? Did you just start compiling research? Did you have researchers, um, anybody from like the Osage Nation uh, as consultants? Whenever we started the film, there had already been a, a bit of research that, you know, had been done by Marianne and, and through that whole process. And um, some of the first photos that that we were seeing were were some, you know, some of the photos of like Fairfax and like the Huska and some of the Osage photography and stuff. But, you know, there, there wasn't a ton of uh, photography with the Osage. It was very hard to find photos for that. You know, there were photos of like some of the villages and stuff. But in terms of like, you know, interiors and, and things like that, it was more about, you know, Jack finding, you know, descriptions of these things in like old newspapers or like correspondences and letters and stuff. And that's how we really started to understand 
that type of world. And then, you know, the closer we got into production, we started having more advisors on and it, we were just freely able to, to communicate and ask questions and they were extremely helpful. And, and Marianne was, you know, she continued to be super helpful throughout the entire film. And anytime we ever got stuck, they would be able to, to help us out and, and find the information that we needed. But when I first started, you know, all I really knew about the film at the time was the script. I just really started becoming an expert at kind of searching these online historical archives. And I, you know, it took a while. It took me like a week to really get it because they're difficult. You know, they're not user friendly at all. Um, but I was going into like Oklahoma and like Kansas and Arkansas, Texas, Missouri, like all the surrounding states that had kind of a similar vibe at, at the time of what, you know, their their little small towns would look like. And then I just started compiling, you know, as many photos as I could that resonated with me for all the interior businesses like, you know, lawyer's office, doctor's office, butcher shop, you know, grocery stores everything and and after you know after a couple months like i had this catalog of photos Look, looking back on it recently sending stuff to apple like for this exhibit i mean the, the photos are this one of the most incredible photos i've ever seen it's it's something i'd never seen before in a movie ever i'd never seen anything to look like these photos and at that point i was like if we can make a movie that kind of has the same vibe as this the, you know the way these photos captured this time period of of this you know, town in Oklahoma and this general area that we could have something special that, you know, has never really existed before, which is the ultimate, I feel like, goal in terms of our job is to be able to work on something and, and do something that is, you know, rarely seen. Jack was just always sending me, you know, paragraphs and paragraphs in email correspondence of, of records that he had looked through and like reading court case trials and just really really like getting to the bottom of everything almost like it was a detective uh like he was a detective like solving a case you know it was very exciting we were in a way making a documentary oh. you know but yeah. just yeah. took it back a hundred years yeah well i think you both did a beautiful job and you made your wish come true as far as like making everything look like a picture because it was absolutely stunning i also heard that the the osage wanted to film on their prop, like on their land. How did that benefit everything? Did you feel like that was beneficial? And, and you built, I heard that you built like dwellings, like almost 50 locations. Tell us a little bit about that. You know, it's, it's in the film, it's so great when you can shoot where the story takes place. You know, we're, you're not in uh, New Mexico building New York City or something like that. Uh, so yeah. we loved it. The other thing is that there was so much evidence of the characters in our film still alive in those towns. Picture is up now is Marty standing in front of an Indian building uh, from about eight, I think it's in the script, it might be 1860 or 1825. I can't remember the date, but this was a scene that he put in to show the Osage bearing a pipe. And it was from a book called, I think the book was called The Pipe in February. It was about them knowing that a lot of their customs wouldn't be taken on by the younger generation. And rather than have them misused or misunderstood, they decided to just to, to bury them. And, and Marty wanted to shoot that scene. So we he developed the scene as in a small structure out in the middle of the Great Prairie. And the elders of the Osage at that time came and had the ceremony where they buried the pipe. This is a different structure. This is in the uh, Gray Horse Village. It's a roundhouse where they did their ceremonial dances and had meetings. And this are the elders are meeting because the deaths in their community, Molly is offered a reward of $1,000 and they want to hire a detective to try and solve the mysteries. Later, the Osage in real life paid the FBI $20,000 to come to Osage County to try and solve the murders. But they came, but they they had to pay to get them there. Adam, do you want to add anything about that? You know, the first time we like we went to Gray Horse, that structure had been updated, but they showed us like where it was, I and mean, it was kind of right in the in the center of where everyone's houses was. And it was so interesting to have like such a communal center like that, like right in the middle of where everyone is kind of passing through. And we had some really great photography of some of the original roundhouse buildings that Marianne had gotten from Fairfax Museum. It's incredible that we were able to build that in the background of her house because just to have it there in the background, he thought it was important to be able to show that way of life. And then slowly we started like kind of going more and more out there 
And it was just incredible to be able to see that from like the backyard, you know, like when we're shooting in the backyard, like the wedding scene, like it's, it's always there. I mean, they're used to owned everything collectively. And that's why when they negotiated uh, for the allotment with the um, United States government before statehood to retain the oil rights, the mineral rights to the land and share them equally with each each of the 2,229 Osage. They also, instead of, uh, normally the government would divide up the land and allot every member uh, 160 acres. They said, no, we want to divide up all the land. And it ended up that each Osage member got about 657 acres. So they negotiated a good deal. They were educated in schools in Pennsylvania and, and Kansas. And uh, there were some smart lawyers. They were under that pressure and they agreed to things they wouldn't, they hadn't agreed to with any other uh, uh, indigenous nation. And that was a real advantage. But I, in terms of the roundhouse, on our first trip there, Addie Ro Roanhorse, who was the, I think a great granddaughter of Henry Roan, who was shot in the red car, you know, in the back of the head. Uh, mm -hmm. She took us to Hominy where they had rebuilt to the original plans, a roundhouse. And she, we went in there and she started describing what it meant to her as a child to go here. And it was very spiritual and she ended up in tears. And that made me realize just how important this ceremony and spiritual beliefs were to the Osage people and how important it was to have that symbol, you know, near our set. We were given a lot of insight, a lot of inspiration, and a lot of support uh, by the Osage, and and also by the, the, the uh, strangely enough, by the white families that live in Osage County, even though it could be detrimental to them to uh, have all the, the story told. But they were, uh, they were very surprisingly open, I thought. Yeah. Can you walk us through the city of Fair, uh, Fairfax? and um, how the, the train station and, and how that all came about and how long did that take to build? It seems uh, massive. <laughs> it took about four weeks. But you know that uh, Fairfax, we shot in Pahuska, but Fairfax originally was a farming community of about 1,500 people. Train station, uh, it was created because the train was missing Gray Horse by about five miles. And uh, so they said, well, we'll build a town around there. And the Osage uh, donated land to the town and business were built up. And so that was from about turn of the century. And we were there uh, about 1919. So there was quite a bit was established and had gone through some evolution. We were shooting in Huska and they gave us like two blocks of derelict buildings that you know, I think there was really one operating store, maybe the, the you know, the appliance store or in one, a couple others in that whole two blocks. And the building owners cooperated and, you know, leased us their space. And we went in and made them more, you know, hospitable. The, a lot of the uh, buildings had leaks in the roof, so they're rotten and they're full of mold. And and we ended up cleaning them out. We re-roofed a few buildings. We put new window frames and glass in them. Adam came and put awnings up everywhere. and. Uh, we slowly brought the town back to life with paint and plaster and, and uh, glass and awnings. And it became a, uh, a wonderful little contained world to, to shoot our town in. We had a blue screen at both ends of the town because over the last hundred years, a lot of trees have grown up and they were behind the buildings in either end. And Fairfax set in the prairie. And when you looked out either side, you would see prairie. You'd see the railroad station, you'd see prairie. So we got visual effects to take out all the trees uh, to make it more like it was and to extend the roads into the and into the prairie. But everything else was pretty practical and shot right in the town. There was one building that was too large and they took four stories off of it. So it became a two story building. But uh, here you can see the town visual effects added the uh, billboard on the, the Big Hill uh, Trading Company's billboard on the on the side of the building because we tried to put it up and it was a windy day as it get windy in uh, Hurricane Alley and just couldn't do it before they shot. So we sent the uh, the file over to visual effects and they put it on the building for us later. But the end of the street 
what you see here, we built the the last building on the right is a livery stable. We built that. And then everything in the distance was uh, CGI. We There was, a, in reality, there was a hill that you went up and the great tall grass prairie was behind it in the distance. But there was a whole neighborhood of homes before you got there. But these are the houses, the buildings that we uh, controlled. We built a lot of fronts. The hotel to the left didn't exist. And we had to cover up a few buildings that were not you know, that were not right for our film or the period. And then we added a movie theater where J.C. Penney's used to be and had fallen down. And basically, you know, started to dress the town. Adam and his crew brought in the telephone poles and all the wiring, which uh, changed it seemingly overnight. Yeah. Uh, of course, the dirt always helps. But the awnings and the telephone poles and 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 the colors, you know, we kind of toned down the colors. And, you know, we work with a old color charts from the period and kind of put together a, a, a bunch of them that we liked and and use those mostly in the telling of the story. So the pool hall slash uh, barbershop. Yeah. I'm, I'm assuming that wasn't existing. Whose idea was it to put the pool hall inside the, or the barbershop, I should say, inside the pool hall? That <laughs> well, was that, one of my favorite things. <laughs> that came from my childhood because I grew up in a small town in Illinois and I used to get my hair cut at the pool hall when I was, my mother would take me and they put a board across the arms of the barbershop chair. And I'd sit up there and they cut my hair and in the, in the distance there'd be old men like shooting pool every once in a while. And it was so mysterious and exciting for me in that little town. So there were three pool halls in Fairfax, the original Fairfax that had uh, barbershops in them. And I mentioned to Marty and he loved the idea because it you know, every time you have a set that can, you can incorporate another set, it just gives you that much more depth and detail. So he embraced it and we just got to work immediately. And we loved it because you could look out that wall of windows you just see everything. And, and you see the whole set. You know, you see the town and and uh, Adam and I were talking last night how the AD kept it populated and moving. And there was always traffic and horses and people and cars. And it made the barbershop really look like a... Uh, a good observation point for these criminals to kind of see what everybody's doing. Keep an eye on Yes. Yeah. And Adam just did such a wonderful job getting the tables and dressing. You ought to talk about that, Adam, because I know it wasn't easy. Yeah, you I was going to ask you about that, Adam. You had some, uh, you had so many sets to cover. And I was going to ask you, did you do most of your shopping in Oklahoma? Or how did you source all this? I feel like I can be kind of stubborn sometimes. And, and I really... Whenever I go to a location like Oklahoma, right, and, you know, the film takes place where we're shooting, it's very difficult for me to want to go to a prop house in L.A. and shop out stuff from a prop house because, you know, certain regions of the country had certain things a little bit more common than other places. You know, when you're getting stuff from a prop house, you don't really know where it's where it came from, where its origin is or, or any of that. So my goal in the beginning was to try and get everything that I could from, you know, as close to the area as possible. And then I would work my way out once I became frustrated or, or couldn't find what I needed. But I mean, I, I shopped all over Oklahoma, all over Kansas, all over Arkansas, Missouri. I went up to uh, Iowa and Nebraska a few times, went down to Texas. Me and my, my team of shoppers had, you know, I feel like we hit every single place at, every place at least within a four hour drive of from where we were. And, you know, we knew everyone's names that on the stores and they, they were just incredibly helpful. And luckily like that period of uh, dressing like early 1900s up until like the, the early twenties, like Oklahoma and like Kansas is probably the best place in the entire country to find that type of furniture. Like you, you may go somewhere else in the country and it's like every now and then you'll see these pieces, but like these pieces were just like, they were everywhere. And it made me feel more comfortable once I started going out and shopping myself and, and started finding all these things. Cause I, I started uh, in December uh, pre Christmas and, and I was there by myself um, for two or three weeks. And, and, you know, there wasn't even really an office there yet. And, Every day for 12 to 14 hours, I went out and I hit every single store, you know, probably in that period within a three hour drive. I just, that's all I did every day. And, you know, I wouldn't even really focus that much when I was in the store. My goal was to go in and anything that felt like uh, 
it pertained to like the time period or the, or the story, I would take photos and I would take wide shots in every place. So by the time my team started, I already had a complete list of places that they, that I knew that they could go to and I knew what was in those stores. So whenever I was sending them out to go look for things, like I knew what, what they were going to be looking at and I knew which place specialized in like plateware, which place specialized in more of the kind of early 1900s Oak furniture. And, uh, and then once we kind of just destroyed that whole area, that's when we really started going out, you know, to like uh, random places in Kansas and Nebraska and just finding barns uh, where collectors just have, you know, nothing but, you know, 1910, you know, quarter sawn oak furniture pieces that are like the pieces that you would never find in a prop house. They're like the ones that are like you would find them in yeah. the catalogs because we had a lot of catalogs mm-hmm. too. Um, I downloaded so many catalogs from furniture companies from that time period. And I had no idea where we were going to find, you know, 10, 1918 Brunswick pool tables. Look at that picture, Adam. They had the, uh, the stove and the wood stove in there. You had a pretty good uh, line of yeah. wood stoves on this film. When I was d- doing all the research, you know, every single business from around, you know, the early 1900s up until like, you know, 1918, 1920, every business had a stove in there like whether it was a lawyer's office or an insurance office and it was always predominant and a lot of times kind of bigger than it should be in the room just from my experience in the past i knew that they were very hard to find and that very few rental houses would have any and if they did they probably would have been repainted 30 times and like missing bolts and stuff so you know my next challenge was my my lead man tony who who's incredible he and uh, one of my shoppers really started trying to look for collectors in the country who had stoves from this time period. And we found three different ones that we kind of narrowed down that seemed to be like the best people to work with that was going to give us the best deal. And and theirs were like the most authentic and had it been completely restored. It was like all original parts. So we had three different vendors. And I think we ended up with a total of about 80 stoves that we had in our warehouse. And then, you know, we just started kind of matching up the ones that we had picked out because we, we picked them out whenever we picked them we had a space for all of them really or at least like a this is our best option for here that kind of matches up with this style that would be in this specific business and then we just kind of assign signed them all to the different sets the company rented a uh, an old carpet factory in pahuska and in that we put our mill our carpenters we put our effects crew we put our sculptors all the automobiles. I think there was about 125 automobiles. We would right. go, come and go, you know, because we changed the color of them by putting new wraps on them and they become another car. And uh, Adam had a big uh, workshop and you had this, uh, your own prop shop, basically. Um, and and we needed to do that because we're, uh, sets we were going in and out of them throughout the whole film. So it wasn't something you could rent and return. We would have had to hold it for the length of the show. And I think it became economical to a, a lot of these because of the prices out there to to obtain the the furniture, put it in our shop, use it, and then worry about selling it afterwards. Yeah, our set deck space was about the size of a Walmart, and it was just completely filled with with furniture and and, and lighting and and everything from this period. And it was really helpful for us because it allowed us to really go further than we probably really needed to in terms of uh, dressing the interiors, because we had, we kind of closed down the whole street. So we basically, you know, we started taking ideas from all these extra furniture pieces that we had and started, uh, you know, making more window displays. And like, we would dress deeper into the stores in case you were to actually see more. Because so we really never knew where they were going to shoot a lot of times, you know, it would be, they, they just kind of got out there and it was like, there's so many places for them to shoot the street scenes. We always wanted to make sure whatever windows were around, felt like they were dressed with enough depth that you could actually, um, you know, believe that it was a real store instead of just like a, a kind of a fake storefront, you know? Well, the town was really great. Um, another important set, I mean, to find out about Molly and her life when you first uh, enter like Molly's house that she shares with her mom, that was another building that you built. Yeah, and well, uh, yeah. I can't believe it. Tell me a little bit about that. It just seemed to me like for the money that the Osage had, they live very modestly they collected the things they liked and you know one of the things they liked was china and ribbons they they did a a ribbon work they did beads and they loved automobiles the way they used to love horses they loved to travel and they would pick up things and ship them back or bring them back in their automobiles to gray horse 
the uh, houses, I was shocked when I first got there because I was told they all lived in mansions. But when I started seeing the houses, they weren't. They were like craftsmen of the period. And they were built, a lot of them were built. Uh, the Osage Nation helped the people who wanted a house build one. They weren't crazy. They weren't ostentatious. And and the people didn't present themselves as wealthy. They did have white servants to help them cook because the women didn't want to have to cook. They liked to cook if they wanted to, but they didn't want to have to cook. And, you know, and the men that weren't working, they couldn't go out and hunt like they used to because all that land was closed to them. So you had a, a society of people that had money coming in. It was interesting to me because the women were just as wealthy as the men. And, you know, in American society, normally, or back at that time, the women were always dependent on the men to bring them income. But in this instance, they weren't. And they, you know, they had just as much money with or without the men, and neither of them needed to work to survive. And I think that's one thing that, and this is my personal opinion, but attracted a lot of the Osage women to the white men because they were kind of fawning and obsequious to them. You know, that it was almost like, um, you know, today where you see, you know, people attracted to, to the other sex that has money, you know, that it's a life that might be easier for you and fun that you can do things you couldn't normally do. So there was a lot of intermarriage, a lot of Osage Women were marrying white men, and a lot of Osage men were, were marrying white women. It reminds me of a, a story. We're looking for a house to be Rita and Bill's house. Now, Rita is Molly's sister, and she moved into Fairfax because she was scared. They were living on a farm in Gray Horse, or right at the edge of Gray Horse. And she bought a craftsman house in there that belonged actually to the doctors, the Schoen brothers' doctors. If you see the film, it's the doctors that take care of Molly. But one of them, I think his name's Peter Schoen, owned this house and she bought it. And just shortly after they moved in, that house exploded and they were killed. She was killed, her husband's killed, and their white housekeeper, Nettie, was killed. And we were looking for a location. I had a picture of their house before the explosion and a picture of it after the explosion. And I found a house in Fairfax, just two blocks from where the original house was. It looked very similar. And I talked with Mike Fantasia, our location manager, and was he was going off to negotiate to see if we could get that house to fix it up and shoot in, ask him if we can blow it up. And I was kind of like half joking and half serious. And he came back the next day. He said, they said, yes, you can blow it up. And I said, I wonder why they, they agreed so readily. And I found out that these two sisters had inherited this house from their grandfather. And their grandfather had a white wife. And she was also his guardian. And in that his lifetime, she took all of his money and made his life miserable. The house had real unpleasant feelings to him, and they were just happy to see it removed. And that allowed us, of course, we couldn't explode a house in town because EPA and the neighbors didn't want us to put an explosion there. So we hand uh, destructed it, but it was great because it was in the same lot, in the same neighborhood, and, and uh, there were remnants of the house that you could recognize. It's getting difficult to blow things up. And when I was younger, you know, we were burning tires and blowing stuff up all the time. But now with the EPA getting in there, it's making it tougher. There's a great scene in the film where Leo comes back from Rita's explosion and he's looking down the stairs to the basement. Molly's there and he tells her his sister's been killed. And you see the whole family like around him in a kerosene lamp. And I tell a story about when we were shooting, we're in the living room and they're reading through the scene and suddenly it comes, you know, like, well, where are we going to hide? And I think Leo or Lily said, how about the basement? And Marty turns to me, he goes, is there a basement? I go, yes, give me 10 minutes. <laughs> and so while the actors were, were getting dressed and made up for the, the scene, we cleaned up the basement and fixed it up right and got the, you know, painted the walls and it made me admire Marty for being so young and inventive and willing to go with a better idea all the time from, you know, he would get a better idea from anyone if he thought it was better. I just, I loved it. It, it excited me. It's my favorite way of making films, you know, where you, you feel you're really making it. You're not, it's not pre-planned and uh, mm -hmm. it's alive and growing. But I thought that was interesting, but their houses were small. Molly's house was small. Her original house that she lived in was her mother's house. And she didn't have a house of, of her own until after her mother died, where she bought a farm in Fairfax, which we don't represent in the film, but we do represent a house 
that she bought there with, you know, with Ernest. It has these porches because they would have people come to the dances and they they would sleep outside on the porches. And the, behind this house was a, a an Indian summer home, which is a kind of a, a stick lodge with canvas over it that people would spend their summers in because it's much cooler than an unair conditioned house. You can see in this picture we have we're pumping air conditioning into for all the actors, but normally they're they're just they're not that comfortable to be in a house that's not ventilated, right? We've gotten spoiled the last hundred years. And we built that house about four miles into the tall grass. Like it was just, you know, extremely deep um on this property and and the locations department had to build roads to get to it. And same with Hell's house. It was just so deep into the into the property, like we had to build roads to get to that as well. And we just rode around those areas forever. And, you know, Jack was like, this is, this is where it's going to be. And then everyone's got kind of like, you want it this far, this far from the road. You know, I was looking for a, a, the, a, something that looked like gray horse and they had a stream in gray horse. And this particular location had a stream that matched the configuration. Yeah, of, exactly. of the one. And, and then I could set up the house in a similar uh, fashion as the one, that they really lived in and, and the gray horse. But uh, yeah, we were walking around on cow paths and stuff to, you know, uh, to, to find locations, but it was great fun. I know uh, one of the supervising art director, Matt had a drone and the location people had drones and that helped us find a lot of the locations and, and it helped us in doing illustrations of the locations eventually. It was incredible building, you know, the little settlement in the, in the back of the house as well. Um, like with the graveyard and everything. Cause like, I feel like on a lot of films that would be done mostly CGI and stuff, but we actually, you know, all that stuff is real and it's all being, you know, populated with extras the whole time. So every time you're looking out of a window, like you can see, you know, movement happening in the background. And we put in those dwellings like way before we shot there because we had access to the location for a while. And so, you know, we went out and got up the, the actual pieces of wood that they would use and bent them all, you know, so that they would dry in place and then, my team went and covered everything with the canvas and let it kind of age in place and, and let the, the grass start to grow up around it. And it just kind of felt like it had been there um, for a while by the time we actually started shooting all, it. All, all the Indian structures became set dressing. Yeah. And Tony with his, wow. uh, uh, you know, chainsaw and, and uh, electric drill was able to, you know, you know, to work with his crew, putting together these structures and they were wonderful. You know, there's a lot of hand care and I'm tying stuff that I don't know if it's, it seemed like a, seemed like a better fit for set dressers than uh, carpenters in a way, because there, there weren't nails in there and it wasn't, we weren't really building with lumber. We were building with sticks. Well. Wow. But tell our viewers here, how long does it usually take to build a structure like that? Because people that aren't in our business, you know, that, that don't work in our business, think that we have months or even like a year to put this together. It took us a week and a half to build all of uh, the dwellings with the sticks and have them covered and all that stuff um, for those specifically. And I don't remember how long it took to build the house. The house was about four weeks, I think. We started in that warehouse, you know, started building the walls. And then we put the foundation uh, out on location and then brought the walls out, stood them up. We had to build pretty soundly because it's in Tornado Alley and we were worried about the wind and the rain and, and uh, flooding. So uh, it was built stronger than a normal set, but it was, uh, it was mm -hmm. done quickly. Yeah. I love that. And what about uh, William Hale's house? Ah, well, that was another built? I mean, <laughs> Yeah, we built William Hale's house. We Everything. built on another ranch completely. <laughs> But the idea was that he was such an important character in a gray horse at the time is to give him some stature. We gave him a four square house, you know, it was bigger than most of the native homes. And unlike Lizzie's house, it was built up. We built this one down in a canyon. You come through the gates and you go down to the house and we painted it. I call it the color of shade. It's a kind of a gray brown. It was just like he was hiding in the shadows, you know, but so present. The interiors were a lot of, uh, I guess it's lincrusta and, and wood and, and dark reds. It was just a nice little layer for this creepy man who was taking advantage of the people who trusted him. Here you see Molly and Ernest having dinner with Hale, and she's telling him she's pregnant for the third time. And, of course, Hale gets really upset because he wants to kill her off. His dining chairs are actually uh, old Masonic chairs 
from the early 1900s, late 1800s with the pressed arms that have been around. And, you know, we've, we found a collection of those chairs and we were like, we just thought it would be really cool, like for his dining chairs to be like actual, like old Masonic chairs. De Niro filled up that house beautifully. I mean, uh, his character became so creepy and it is so subtle that you didn't notice it as much when you're shooting as when it was edited together. You became really a, a fool and kind of frightening person. Yeah, and I was watching a documentary last night. I couldn't get over how he resembled Hale. Yeah, a few years older, but he, he's a master actor. All the actors in the sh show were great, but he surprised me the most because it was so subtle when he was doing it, and it was so complete when it was put together. Lily, of course, everybody's like realized how great she is, and Leo took on a role that's really difficult. You know, to be loving someone and killing him at the same time is not easy to justify or to make sense in your head. And I know it was a struggle with him, but he I thought he did a masterful job. Also, one really weird side note about Hill's property is it was a it was a wild horse ranch also. So every time we were driving to work on these roads that we had built to get in, there would just be like, you know, like eight hundred horses just like grouped together. Running. And like crossing the road, like in the morning at six o'clock in the morning, you had to like wait on this whole massive like group of horses. <laughs> it was crazy. The Masonic Hall. I have a question about that. The black and white checkered floor, was that a carpet or was that something that was in the space or in the research? That was in the research, but was hand painted by the set decorators in their shop. And that room was, uh, it was about 75 feet long and it had a blue carpet in it. I remember calling Marty and going, Marty, I, I have this idea of painting a Masonic Lodge dark blue. And he says, that sounds great. <laughs> Yeah, and we were also looking at like Egyptian <laughs> temples, uh, you know, in in, uh, in Egyptian uh, like burial chambers, like the, the kind of the dark kind of midnight sky blue that they would use to paint the insides of the, uh, the Egyptian tombs and stuff. When we were looking at colors for that. Yeah, I can't get over the amount of um, buildings that you built, to be honest with you. Well, you know, not much else to do out there in Oklahoma. So you, no stage sets at all. Everything was like on a location and. A couple of the builds that I, I really loved in the film were um, that probably should have been built on stage. But again, we like built outside around town was one was the photo studio. And you, you don't really get to see very much of this set. It kind of flashes on screen for like three or four seconds. But, you know, we built an entire actual photo studio set with the inclined glass wall and Jack had it oriented to the sun so that, you know, they were able to use the sun as their light source to be able to take their photos. And we had like set up all these silks, like covering all of the windows that were on a track system that could be moved back and forth that you would be able to move around to be able to like control your light for the photo studio. But we built this thing in the parking lot, like behind our main street, <laughs> like instead of building it on a stage, it was just outside sitting there so that the sunlight could actually light the set instead of, you know, lighting it with giant, you know, 20K lights. A lot of times it was just easier to build something than to move the company four hours somewhere to set up to shoot and maybe have to create new housing form and get caters and everything out there. So we were able to encourage our producers to let us build stuff when we could offset the cost of building with the cost of transporting, you know, our crew and worrying about housing and keeping the housing that they had. One of the interesting sets for me was the uh, courtroom that was built inside a church in Pahuska. And in the basement of that church, we built our jailhouse, you know, all the bars and stuff. We had the uh, metal department working and they built all the jail bars out of steel. They were wonderful. This is the courtroom. This is actually built inside a church. And we used the ceiling of the okay. church as the ceiling of our courtroom. We just tied it in. Rodrigo was able to put light in there and pump it through those windows to get that effect. So it was a, I thought it was a pretty unique build and a good use of a location. Yeah, it's really incredible. I had no idea. I thought it was a courtroom. And it was only like three blocks off of Main Street where that yeah. as well. You could just walk, you know, to, from the art department to the <laughs> to the jail, to the courtroom, to the town, like to different the stuff. station, to the Red Hill. It was all, it's my favorite way to work is, we, we did that on There Will Be Blood as we had everything within walking distance. It, it's, it just makes it fun. You're like kids getting to play. Yeah. And did he have a list of movies to watch? Oh, all his favorite movies? Sometimes he would say movies, I would never even know what they were. I was like, what is that? I know. <laughs> never heard my of that first, movie. My first meeting with Marty because of COVID was on a Zoom. 
And he kept mentioning all these movies. He said he wanted to make a Western and he wanted to do this film about the Osage and have it true. And he listed all these movies. And after I got off, it was a pleasant conversation. I said to the producer, she said, well, how'd it go? And I said, it was great. But Marty mentioned about 13 films I've never heard of. And she said, I'll send you a list. <laughs> <laughs> and she did. Just her heart as you. The only film that I really remember referencing and I talked to him about was The Gates Going Into Hales, reminiscent of the ones from Giant, you know, where uh, Elizabeth Taylor's going to the ranch for the first time. The location set up was great for that. Is there anything else you guys want to add, Adam? Um, what about your team? It seems like you had a really big team to put this all together. Yeah, it was a great team. Um, you know, my lead man, Tony Zegler, he he worked with me for the first time on Causeway um, with Jack. He's actually from New Orleans. He's always really great at going to a location and finding great, great people that work, you know, it, as a local. And he worked with me on Bike Riders, too, Jeff, uh, Jeff Nichols' film that's coming out soon also. And he did the same thing. You know, he would go in and just, like, find these guys that were just, like, they become my favorite set dressers I've ever worked with. The set dressers were just every single one of them had the same enthusiasm as me. And they were all excited about the, everything they were doing. And same as like my shoppers, you know, like Andrew and, and Danny and Javid, they're all basically decorators, you know, and, and they, like Javid, he's been, he's one of my oldest friends. And he actually worked on that first film with me I was telling you about. And, you know, my assistant decorator, Olivia Peoples, she just also the most perfect person possible to come and work with me on this film because she was like a twin of me. It turned into this like wonderful family. And we were just, you know, we would always go out to dinner and, and, and just hang out after work. And it became, it made it much easier for us to, to be in Bartlesville for a year, having this group of people that um, were, were so special. And um, yeah, I was very, very lucky uh, to put together this group of people I, you were really helpful your crew i mean andrew was in tulsa and i was trying to get a stained glass window door for the molly's house and it was the last minute no one had been able to find it and i found one that what is it dead people's stuff or something? yeah yeah it was oh, called dead people's stuff and uh <laughs> and i and andrew said well i got a truck going to tulsa today i'll pick it up and he got it there and then the carpenters had like a you know one day to get it fit in the house and uh and marty really used it when uh the different departments click and everybody's helping everybody. It's yeah. my favorite way of making films. Yeah. yeah. Well, you could tell it really shows it really does. Megan McClure. Uh, she was a, a supervising art director. did the town and the train station. And it was like you with Olivia, you know, it was, we'd walk the town every night at seven 30 and figure out what had to be done. And it was exciting to work together, you know, with other people that have the same interests and the same passion. I love it when people care about what they do and mm -hmm. all anybody wanted to do in all of our departments was to get it as accurate as possible and make sure we were telling the story through the characters as accurate as possible. And everyone on all around took it as seriously as me and Jack. And it just became like a, you know, the best, the best possible uh, group group effort you could have on film, I think. You know, I noticed with the set directors, they don't take the same breaks as carpenters do. You know, they just, they work nonstop and they're excited about every minute of it. But, you know, they get to see things from the beginning to the end. And sometimes carpenters get moved from one job to another. And, and I think that's kind of dangerous in a way because it they don't feel as much a part of one set or any one set. And if I had my druthers, I would get people to follow through, you know, to start building something and take it all the way to its completion. And, you know, film companies, you, you know, you woke up one morning and the next day you're in Oklahoma and, and then you're working like crazy with, with strangers to build an impossible uh, world. And when it works out, it's so uh, exciting and rewarding. I wanted to mention that uh, we, we work closely with uh, Jacqueline West, a costume designer and how, we, you know, exchanged research and how helpful she was to us and, you know, in loaning us clothing and the design of the clothing, working with the sets. I've done nine films with Jackie and and uh, I forget to mention sometimes just how valuable that is for a designer and decorator to have that relationship with the costumes because they're going to be populating your sets. So they become dressing in a way. Yeah, the textiles were beautiful. I loved all the blankets, everything. 
yeah, we were dealing with Barry as well, who who she was getting her blankets with, and we we were getting some from him. But also, like we were going to so many stores, we would just, you know, at a random hole in the wall antique store, we'd find like a Pendleton blanket from like 1915 that's probably worth about like seven hundred dollars, and it would just be for sale for like thirty dollars, you know. And it oh, was wow. yeah, it, it was it was cool seeing the real blankets that you know you knew probably were owned by Osage people, just you know in stores just the real things, you know, down the street from where we're shooting. Yeah. Well, it seems like a, a, a great adventure that you had there. Adam, do you have any, what is like your fondest or your best memory of working that whole time? Or maybe, maybe two memories. What can you take away from this? I mean, honestly, getting to work with Jack Fisk for a year on location somewhere and, and just being able to like learn from him and absorb how he looks at things and and his work ethic and it's just honestly it's it's just like the greatest thing you could probably ever have and another thing is like me and my wife now we got married in Pahuska at the courthouse and we ended up having uh conceiving having she became pregnant while we were there and and now he's he's like you know 20 months old so that that happened I guess that's what happens whenever you're somewhere for a year <laughs> well congratulations that's yeah. well, that's the best memory that, that was amazing but again, that. Uh, you know and i guess if it would be like a third thing it's just being able to find people out in the world who are obsessed with certain things that you can actually learn a lot from um you know who are the collectors who who can give you that amount of information of something that you would never be able to find online or like in a book. It's just having direct, direct, direct contact with, with experts that are just, you know, their favorite thing in the world is like butcher equipment from, you know, 1917, you know, and he, he like would show me the catalog from 1917 that had all the items in it that he had that they would have in a butcher shop and we would show him our references. And he's like, Oh my God, I have that. I have that. I have that. And he's like obsessed with being able to see these photos that he had never really seen before because, you know, they're not really, where would he have really seen them? But that that was amazing for me. I just want to say thank you for joining us on Inside the Set and for sharing all your insight on Killers of the Flower Moon. Um, I congratulate both of you and wish you the best of luck uh, for this award season. And I hope I get to see both of you again soon. Thank you. Thank it, was, you. it was a pleasure. I enjoyed it. We've kind of already gotten our reward in a way. So it's, uh, you know, just. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for joining us for this episode of Inside the Set with Set Decor. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel and visit our website, setdecor.com.